Hello dear friends, this is your personal English coach Divyam here and today we're gonna discuss the chapter number 6 known as Virtually True. So let's begin. Sebastian Schultz. It isn't a name you come across every day, but there it was, large and clear, at the top of the newspaper article in front of me. The reader of the newspaper was a big woman. I couldn't see her face, but I could hear her wheezy breath. So we can assume that the narrator is reading a newspaper which apparently he is not holding it is held by a big woman a fat woman whose breath is being heard miracle recovery the headline said sebastian schultz a 14 year old schoolboy from south london awoke yesterday from coma that doctor feared might last forever so this was the actual headline that the boy or the narrator is reading it's talking about a recovery which was impossible and the guy is known as Sebastian Schulz, a 14 year old schoolboy from South London. He was in coma from a long time but he had a walk yesterday. It couldn't be the Sebastian Schulz admit. I lean forward to read the rest of the article. So the narrator could not believe that it is the same Sebastian Schulz with whom he had dealt in the past. Six weeks ago, Sebastian Schulz was badly injured in a motorway accident. His condition on arrival at the General Hospital was described as critical, though stable. Despite doctors' hopes, the boy did not regain consciousness. His parents were informed that their son was in coma. So, before six weeks, Sebastian Schulz met with an accident and doctors gave up all the dreams of recovering him. And his parents were also informed that the boy has no chances of recovery. He's gonna die. He's right now in coma. But here the narrator is talking about a miracle recovery. So the boy could not be recovered. And now he was awake in all his senses. At a press conference, Mrs. Schultz said, The doctors were doing all they could. But in our hearts, we knew we needed a miracle. So the mom of the boy he said that the doctors were trying hard to do everything possible and if something could save Sebastian that was just a miracle now that miracle has happened which means now the boy has recovered so somehow the miracle happened and made the boy come to his senses at that moment the women's hand moved I suddenly saw the photograph that went with the story and gasped the boy in the picture was Sebastian there was no doubt. But how? I muttered. So, we can assume that the narrator is reading the newspaper held by the big fat lady and the hand of the big fat lady was on the picture of Sebastian Schultz. And when she wanted to maybe flip the page or adjust to some other line, she moved her hand and she saw a picture of the boy who just awoke yesterday named Sebastian and then the narrator who's reading the newspaper he couldn't believe because it was talking about the same Sebastian with whom he dealt in the past so he's really surprised how can this happen how can this be the same boy whom I met Sebastian Schultz the boy I'd got to know so well recently had apparently been in coma for all that time I felt nervous and shivery it didn't make any sense at all so we can assume that the narrator had a lot of uh, dealing with Sebastian Schultz and so he was feeling nervous that how can he come back to recovery when when he was in coma from a long time I stared out of the, out of the train window and ran through the events in my head so now the narrator is trying to recall everything that happened with him and Sebastian He's looking out of the train window so by now we know that the narrator is sitting in a train there is a big fat lady in front of him and she was reading the newspaper and the newspapers headline maybe she was reading the middle page and the newspaper had opened on the face of the narrator and it talked about Sebastian dad's nutty about computer He's got a Pentium 150 megahertz processor with 256 of RAM, 1.2 GB hard drive and 16 speed CD-ROM complete with speakers, printer, modem and scanners. It can do anything, paint, play music, create displays, 
Even when my home looks rubbish, it looks fantastic. This stands on means that the narrator's father is really a techie or a tech savvy guy. He has everything that can make work smooth. So he has computers, he has advanced computers which can do just about anything. So they've given some specifications. Best of all are the games. Tornado, Meba Bash, Black Belt, Kareen's Castle. I've played all of them. So he says that my dad is really a tech savvy guy and he has everything that makes the work easy and smooth but the best part is the games. I love playing games in dad's, dad's uh, setup. With the screen so big, the volume up loud, it almost feels as if you're inside the game, battling it out with the Z or B's, twisters or whatever. So, which means if there was a twister inside the game, because of the setup, which, which was really advanced, the narrator could actually feel it. So no, the narrator is, is imagining himself to be in that situation when he is playing the game. Technology was advancing every day and dad couldn't resist any of the new gadgets or gizmos that came on the market. That was why we went to computer fair. We came away with virtual reality wizard and a glove and handful of the latest interactive psycho drive game. They are terrific. Not only do the wizard and the glove change what you see, but better than that, you can control the action by what you're thinking. Well, cool. So, because of this dad's attitude of having the latest gadgets, the dad got to know about some computer fair which sold latest gadgets and the dad and the son went to the computer fair and they bought a wizard and a glove. So, wizard is something like a, a virtual reality helmet and there's also a glove. So, it's, it's actually controlling the items on the screen. So, you would actually feel that you're inside the game while uh, you might just be sitting in your room. When we got them, I remember some of them were not new. So, the narrator is stating here that when they got this new stuff, some of them were second hand, so they were not brand new, they were used by someone, they were already utilized by someone. Anyway, back home I launched myself off into the first of games, it was called Wild West. Soon as they got back from the computer fair, the narrator just wired himself to the games and first was the Wild West. That's what I like about computers. The more futuristic they get, the better you can understand the past. I wasn't standing in the co converted loft, the power base, as dad calls it, anymore. I was really there, striding down the dusty track through the center of the town. There was sh a sheriff's badge pinned to my shirt. So, the narrator is imagining himself to be a sheriff because he's playing this game. And power base is the name given to the room by the dad because it has everything that makes the work easy. It has all the advanced technologies. So here the narrator was playing a game called the Wild West where he was a sheriff. As I burst in through the swing doors of the saloon, everyone went silent and glared at me. I strode over to the bar. Sarsa Perilla. I said, and glass of fizzy red stuff came sliding along the bar towards me. As I took a sip, I heard a loud crash. I spun around. There, saluted, in the doorway, was a black-eyed Jed, the fastest gun in the West. This town ain't big enough for the both of us, Sheriff Dawson. He drawled and fingered his gun lightly. Outside, just you and me. So these are just the events happening inside the game. So, so it's as if the narrator is ordering a drink, which, which is coming along his way. And while he was drinking, there was a, another guy who is at the doorway and he's addressing the narrator that the town is small and Sheriff Dawson is nothing but the narrator and he is holding his gun and he's asking the narrator to come out so he's asking the narrator 
that we are just both of us here and let's get out of here I can remember the grinning it was really cool I finished my drink and slammed the glass down on the bar Jed had already left the saloon all eyes were on me again I wondered what sort of score I was notching up all at once something strange happened up to that point the game had been pretty much as I expected but when the second sheriff peered through the back door shouting and waving his arms about I realized that game was more complicated so here there is another sheriff who is signaling uh, the narrator to do something so till now the narrator felt as if everything's good everything's smooth but it's not as he thought it's not as he anticipated there's something more to do inside the game don't go out said the second sheriff and who are you I asked he wasn't like the other characters in the saloon for a start he was about my age and though he looked like a computer image he somehow didn't move like one so the second character is asking the narrator to not to go out and when inquired about his identity uh, the narrator says that he looked like an image but he didn't move like a computer image there's no time to explain he shouted just follow me so the second sheriff is asking the narrator to just follow him and don't ask any more questions I did what I was told we raced down a corridor and through a door we ran past some men and out through another door come on he shouted we went on through another door and another and ended up back in the saloon no screaming the second sheriff then he ran to the back of the saloon and dived through the window by the time I climbed climbed out after him he was already sitting on a horse jump up so here we can see that the second sheriff is asking the narrator to follow him because there seems to be some trouble at their backs so they are running out of the saloon and uh, they were they were sitting on a the, the second sheriff was sitting on a horse and he's asking the narrator to jump on the horse he kicked the horse and we sped off in a cloud of dust so they are running away then the narrator is asking who are you but the second sheriff didn't answer he'd seen the pose of men on horseback speeding after us keep your head down he said so here we see that the second sheriff is in trouble and second sheriff as well as the narrator both of them they get into the um, trouble some kind of trouble and uh, the second sheriff is asking the narrator to run away so while they're sitting on a horse uh, there is a group of people chasing them and maybe shooting so he asks the narrator to keep his head down because he might get shot at that moment the sound of the gunshot echoed round the air the second sheriff groaned and slumped back against me ahead of me in bright neon light game a message game over so these are nothing but the events that happen inside the game so here we see that there is a person um, uh, who is in trouble who is the second sheriff who is in trouble and uh, groan and slump back against me means he dies inside the game so soon as he dies um, the, the screen it gives a message called game over so so here we see that first game is over there's a guy who's in trouble and uh, uh, somehow we figured that the mission of the first sheriff was to save him but somehow we could not as I slipped off the visor the empty desert disappeared and I found myself back in the 12th power base so now uh, because this was a game and when the game was over he, the the narrator realizes that he is still in the power base I took off the glove and headphones I glanced at the score on the screen 21,095 then I noticed the printer had come on I picked up the piece of paper from the tray at the top was a picture of second sheriff this time though he was wearing jeans and sweatshirt printed over the bottom was a message I'm stuck please help to retrieve me try Dragon Quest Sebastian Schultz so here we see that Sebastian Schultz is sending a message to the narrator to help him out in the game called Dragon Quest so the communication takes place on the printer 
I wanted to go straight into the game he'd suggested, but it was already half an hour after lights out. Next morning I was up and back on the computer and was soon walking through the massive studded doors of the dragon's castle lyre. So here, the narrator, because it was too late, he stopped playing that day and the other day in the morning, he accepted the request to play Dragon Quest and he instantly got inside the game. And as he states, he is walking through the massive studded door. So he is inside the castle already. He is, he is playing the game so he could imagine himself uh, being in the castle. The aim of the game was simple. I had to rescue Fair Princess Aurora from the wicked dragon and collect the wicked creature's treasure along the way. I would already got loads by the time I reached the princess who had been imprisoned at the top of the tall tower. She was a young woman with long golden plates. So here the narrator states that the aim of the game was to save the princess who was somewhere and this line I would already got loads by the time I reach. So this means that the, the narrator has enough of time to save the princess. My hero, she squealed. Take me away from all this. Behind me I could hear the dragon roaring. Rescue me now, the princess said urgently. So till now, the narrator thinks that the aim is very simple. I just need to save the princess from the dragon and run away. Never mind her, came a voice and the second knight, and second knight appeared from the wardrobe. It's me who needs rescuing. So, the thought process of the narrator breaks here. Why? Because the narrator need not follow the goal of the game. He, he does not need to save the princess. But as we saw the request on top, I'm stuck. Please help to retrieve me. It's not from any princess. It's from Sebastian Schultz. So Sebastian Schultz is the second knight who actually sent the request to the narrator to save him. So he says, don't mind her, don't think about her, don't worry about her. It's me, it's me who's in trouble, so rescue me, don't rescue her. Sebastian, I said. The sec second knight nodded. Quick, he said, while there's still time. And with a pair of scissors, he chopped off Princess's two long plates. Then he tied them together, fixed one end around the bedpost and threw the other and out of the window. Now, he screamed as he leapt for the window and down the hair row. So, uh, we can imagine how the second knight managed to get out of the window by tying princess's hair across the bed and then he's asking the narrator to climb down the hair and get out. At that moment, the dragon appeared. I gasped and leapt too. I lowered myself down and felt the dragon's fiery breath across the moonlit battlements. We ran down the spiral staircase through a street passage on the other side of the tip street. And the whole time I could hear and feel and even smell the evil dragon following in close pursuit. So now we can imagine that two people are running forward, the dragon chasing them and they are running down the castle and because they are talking about moonlit battlements which means it's night and the castle is lit with moonlight uh, we can imagine the whole situation here and the narrator is so much inside the game that he is stating that he could feel and hear and even smell the evil dragon the dungeons said Sebastian there are, there are only hope we went down the cold stone steps, swords drawn. Suddenly, dragon appeared at the end of the corridor. Before we even had time to turn around, the dragon was upon us. I swung my sword, but it was no good. The dragon was only interested in Sebastian, and, the, and there was nothing I could do to prevent it getting him. So again, there is a second game where Sebastian needs help. He is reaching out to the narrator for help, but the narrator could not help Sebastian get out of the trap which is inside the game. The narrator does everything he could, but he cannot. This time the message in the printer said, better luck next time. Please don't give up Michael, 
Otherwise, I'll have to stay in here forever. Try jailbreak. I think it might just work. Cheers, Seb. So Sebastian has now sent another game request. He wants the narrator to come into the game called jailbreak. So from this line, we can say that the narrator's name is Michael and he's asking Michael to get inside another game. And uh, what we see from this line is the narrator somehow has to save Sebastian to relieve him, to set him free somehow. So Sebastian is always in trouble in all the games and he has to be saved by this narrator named Michael. I didn't even bother to read the rules of jailbreak before going in. I knew that my task would be to rescue the boy and sure enough my cellmate was prisoner 02478 Schultz. So the narrator Michael, he already knows that I have to save Schultz. So there is no aim, there is no goal of the game, there are no tasks. My only task is to save Sebastian Schultz. I've got to get out of here, Sebastian sighed. Are you going to help? Of course, I said. Have you got a plan? So we can imagine a cell, a prison cell, wherein Schultz and Michael are the inmates and Schultz said he needs to get out somehow. Stupid question. With the help of skeleton swipe cards, we were soon out of the cell and racing down the corridors. Sirens wailed, guard dogs howled, heavy boots came tramping behind us, steel barred doors slammed shut. We dodged the guards, we fled the dogs, we made it to the staircase and pounded upwards. So, there is something called skeleton swipe card which is a plastic card on which data has been stored. So somehow we can imagine that Michael and Sebastian they get out of the jail with dogs and sirens and boots following them. So next on the roof Sebastian looked around and glanced his watch nervously. It should be here by now. So Sebastian is waiting for something. What was that? What? I said. That, said Sebastian and pointed. A helicopter, I exclaimed. That was my idea, said Sebastian excitedly. If only it would go a bit faster. So we can imagine that Sebastian has called a helicopter and Sebastian is taking Michael to that helicopter and Sebastian is telling Michael that it was my idea to get a helicopter but I think it's pretty slow. At that moment, the door behind us burst open. Twelve guard dogs with a, with vicious twelve guards with vicious dogs were standing there. The next instant, dogs were hurtling towards us, all bared teeth and dripping jaws. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Sebastian take a step backwards. No, I screamed, but it was too late. The boy had slipped and was tumbling back through the air down to the concrete below. So here we see that in this game Sebastian needs some rescuing like other games but the problem here is Sebastian is getting out of the jail. Sebastian has also called a helicopter which Michael wants uh, which he wants Michael uh, to help him out and reach the helicopter somehow but the helicopter was slow so he wanted Michael to do some trick and help him reach the helicopter but there were guard dogs, there were all the security people who were following um, them because they were prisoners and they could not really reach the helicopter. So as the guard dogs approached Sebastian, Sebastian fell down and he died. So Michael could not save Sebastian like any other game and the message appeared, game over. As I removed my visa. I looked in the printer tray. This time it was empty. I felt really bad. I failed Sebastian. I'd failed the game. It was only later when the scenes be began to fade in my memory that it could occur to me that Sebastian Schultz was the game. Well, so now Michael could see that there was no message. Sebastian is no more asking for help. So, so, so Michael felt bad. He said that. I am a failure in all the games I'm unable to save Sebastian. So he's also thinking that Sebastian Schultz was the game himself. 
Strangely, although I went back to the Wild West Dragon Quest and Jailbreak after that, I never met up with Sebastian. So Michael is looking out for Sebastian. Is he there? No, he is not. Then yesterday, I heard from Sebastian. In the printer tray was a sheet of paper. Can we have one last try? It said. I think the helicopter was right idea. There's gotta be some kind of an accident. Go into war zone. If this doesn't work, I won't bother you again. Cheers, Seb. So here we, see, here we see that Sebastian desperately needs some rescuing, and he's trying to give clues to the or uh, to the narrator, Michael, to keep playing some of the other games here so that he can be saved. I couldn't tell which war zone where we were in. It was a city somewhere, a tall building where windowless and riddled with holes. The tall buildings were windowless and riddled with holes. Machine gun fired, rigged the sky, walls tumbled, bombs exploded. All I knew was that Sebastian and I had to make it to that helicopter in one piece. So here, the goal of the game is Sebastian and Michael somehow need to reach a helicopter in the middle of machine guns raining bullets on them. We ran across a no man's land of rubble and smoke dodging sniper fire at the far end we went through a door in a wall the helicopter was on the ground waiting for our arrival so we can imagine a situation where there was a helicopter on the ground and there's a lot of smoke there's a lot of fire there's a lot of bullets and Sebastian and Michael are running 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 and trying to reach a helicopter which was waiting for them we started to run, but the tank fire sent us scuttling back to the wall. A jeep, Sebastian shouted to me and nodded at the vehicle parked by the road. He jumped in, turned the ignition key and revved the engine. Jump in! So Sebastian is asking Michael to get into a jeep which he noticed so that they are able to reach the helicopter easily rather than running in the middle of bullets and machine guns and smoke. I climbed into the passenger seat and we were off. A tank was hurtling after us. So behind them was a tank which was following them. Suddenly Sebastian slammed on the brakes and sent the jeep skidding into a spin. I leapt clear and jumped into the helicopter. So here Sebastian applied the brakes and uh, he applied the brakes in such a way that the jeep drifted a little bit and because it was too fast it was traveling too fast now the Jeep has, has started to spin so as soon as it was uh, starting to spin Michael got out of the Jeep he jumped out of the Jeep and jumped into the helicopter instantly the helicopter started to go upwards I looked around Sebastian wasn't there so what happened here is Sebastian applied brakes the Jeep tumbled the narrator or Michael got out of the Jeep and got into the helicopter instantly uh, assuming that Sebastian would also have got into the helicopter along with him but did that happen no it didn't the helicopter already took off so Michael says wait I shouted at the pilot I look back Jeep had stopped but Sebastian hadn't got out so somehow Sebastian was stuck inside the Jeep and he couldn't really get out. Come on, I yelled. But Sebastian was sitting as if his body had been turned to stone. The tank crashed into the Jeep. Sebastian was thrown into the air. So the Jeep was tumbling as we know and a tank was following both of them. And somehow the Jeep and tank, they dashed and Sebastian was thrown out into the air in such a way that he landed up at the doors of a helicopter. Round and round he tumbled closer to the helicopter. He landed with a thud just below the hatch. I pulled him up. As he sat down beside me, the helicopter soared into the sky. So we can imagine how a jeep can dash with a tank and because of the dash, Sebastian was thrown out of the jeep. He coincidentally ended up near the door of the helicopter. And there is this Michael who's already inside the helicopter pulling him into the helicopter. And th therefore he is proud. He is happy now. He says, 
I'd done it. I'd rescued Sebastian at last. Before I had a chance to say anything to him, though, the helicopter flew into thick cloud. It turned everything blinding white. I couldn't see a thing until game over flashed up. So, in this game here called Warzone, Sebastian is somehow able to... Um, Sebastian was saved by Michael somehow, as we saw uh, after many events unfolding. And then there's a message called game over. When I removed the visor, the screen was flashing a score of uh, uh, 400 lakh or we can say 4 crore. I'd hit the jackpot. I'd finally cracked the game. So now Michael is assuming that he had cracked the game. He had uh, finally, he was able to save Sebastian. At least that was what I thought then. Now I knew that Sebastian Schultz, the boy from the game, really doesn't exist. I'd seen the proof in the newspaper. But how? I wondered as I got off the train. So here we can see that the narrator or author is actually inside the train and he's, he's trying to imagine all the situation that he had with um, the, uh, Sebastian and all the games that he played. He's trying to recall all of them. And uh, now he knew, uh, he knew that Sebastian Schultz was actually inside the game. It was not in the reality. It was not in the reality and he, it was just a game. It's not a person. Line number 84 says, but how? I wondered as I got off the train. At home I checked the net. I wanted to learn more about the miracle recovery. So he got into, into the power base to find out more details about this particular guy and the miracle recovery that he just read inside the train. I found what I was looking for quickly enough. Apparently, at the time of the incident, Sebastian was using his laptop to play one of his, uh, one of the same Psycho Drive games that I have got. My heart pounded furiously. What if, because Sebastian had been plugged into the computer when he banged his head in the accident, the computer has saved his memory in its own? And then, what if weird version of the games I'd been drawn into had all? been attempts to retrieve the memory now see here friends uh, this stanza is the actual fiction part it talks about a person dashing to a computer screen and the computer saving all of his memory which is never possible so here Sebastian says that Sebastian is uh, Sebastian sorry Michael is imagining that what if Sebastian uh, was playing a game and while playing he banged his head onto the computer and saved um, and the computer had saved his memory so Sebastian memory was inside the computer and all the attempts that Sebastian was uh, asking Michael to try were all the uh, attempts to just get back the memory so this is uh, the actual fiction part which most of my friends get confused so just imagine it this is not real this is all virtual after all, dad always says about computer's memory, it can never forget, Michael, nothing ever gets lost. But even if it was possible that Sebastian's memory had been stored on a disk, how had it ended up on my computer? That is a real coincidence here. So if Sebastian banged his computer and uh, his memory was inside the computer, then how did the narrator or Michael had got that piece of computer? How? How is it possible that the same computer was with Michael? Scrolling down the article, I found a possible explanation. Answering a reporter's question as to what the family was going to do next, Mr. Schultz said that they were off to stock up on some games. It was while we were in the hospital, someone stole the lot. I don't know what happened to them. Now stole the lot means stole the game. So Mr. Schultz say uh, is, is, is telling everyone uh, in the press to the reporters that while we were in the hospital someone stole the game and I don't know where they went. I said quietly they ended up at the computer fair and we bought them. So here we can imagine that uh, Mr. Schultz, the father of Sebastian Schultz, is in the hospital uh, with the games around and someone has stolen the games and now um, that someone, that thief, has sold those games somewhere and it ended up in computer fair to which Michael and his father went and coincidentally they purchased 
the same piece that Sebastian had. I left the net and checked my email. There was one from Sebastian. With trembling fingers, I clicked in and read the message. Dear Michael, it said, thank you. I'm not sure how it happened, but thanks. You saved my life. Let's meet up soon. Cheers, Sebastian. Please see. Keep the games. You've earned them. I shook my head. A real message from the real Sebastian Schultz. We both knew that by relieving the accident, something wonderful had happened. But then again, now that there are two advanced intelligences on Earth, who can say what is and what isn't possible? What I know is this. Everything that I've described is true, virtually. So here, the narrator realizes that Sebastian memory had been stored on a disk because the computer had saved Sebastian memory as it run. And uh, when Sebastian had banged his head uh, in an accident, all of this happened. Now, this all, now we already know this. Um, so here, uh, there is a coincidence. When the narrator or Michael checks the email, he sees an email from Sebastian addressing him directly that, you know, Sebastian isn't really aware of how things unfolded and he also he's also thanking Michael uh, and he's, he's telling him that he's not sure how this happened but as you saved my life you've got this computer so this is a real coincidence and uh, 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 line number 95 says I shook my head a real message we both knew that by uh, relieving the accident something wonderful happened but then again now that there are two advanced intelligences on earth who can say what is and what isn't possible so uh, we can assume that this was a coincidence coincidence that Michael got a piece of the same game that Sebastian was playing or we can say that this was already planned by Sebastian Schultz now it is left to us to decide what is the actual conclusion of the story and in the last line what I know is this everything that I've described is true virtually again the, the writer has put us in a real confusion by telling that whatever it described on top, whatever it described on top, that Sebastian's memory is getting inside the computer and uh, the coincidence that happens with Michael and Sebastian uh, is all fictional. Because this is a fiction, chapter of fiction, it's all imaginary. So the, the, the confusion that my friends and students face is in the fact that Sebastian's memory gets inside the computer number one the second confusion is the email that Michael gets from Sebastian so this is we can say that this was already planned either we can say that it was already planned or we can say that this was a real uh, coincidence and Sebastian is trying to actually communicate with Michael and thank him somehow by this incident so uh, the ending might sound confusing but it's actually left to us to decide on how we want to conclude so friends this is basically the chapter virtually true and as I said couple of my students couple of my friends they really get into a dilemma of the ending but uh, if this comes into the exam you can smartly um, frame sentences in such a way that it justifies the ending so I hope you understood this chapter and if you have any doubts if you have any requests do send me an email at I write a mail ID at gmail.com or if you have some request for explanation of any chapter it may be any topic in grammar it may be any topic out of the syllabus in English it may be any chapter do write me an email and I will make sure to help you understand thank you so much and have a great day